By the time uh, Carrie Chapman Katz arrived in New Mexico that December, she had crisscrossed the country for years, traveling on trains, carts, wagons, and cars to bring the message of suffrage to cities, towns, villages, and rural areas all over the western states. How had she and New Mexico gotten to this point on the verge of uh, the signing of the uh, 19th Amendment to the Constitution? So just before I, uh, I go into that, it's important to see what the demographics of New Mexico were at that time. There were, in, 20, in 1920, there were 327,000 of people in the state. 83% lived in rural areas, 48.5 were non-English speakers. Among the women, Nuevo Mexicanos comprised 56%, Euro Americans or Anglos, 37%. Native Americans, 6%, African Americans, less than 1%, and Asians, even less than that. So we got here to the eve of suffrage, uh, as, as we get to any major event in history. It is a confluence of events that gets us there. More and more women acknowledge they have the same innate capabilities as men. Women from, from excuse me, women's clubs formed for self-improvement and then for community improvement. Women needed the power in their own hands to effect real change. And that's how women's suffrage came around. And then they joined forces, the, the women's clubs and the suffrage clubs, and it became a mass movement. Eventually, there was a bifurcation in the strategy of the suffrage forces. Some went um, for a federal amendment and others went for amendments in the states. And lastly, World War I really brought about a change in the country that allowed final fermentation, actually, of the amendment to come to the fore. So more and more women acknowledge they have the same innate capabilities as men. As in the rest of the nation, the suffrage movement in New Mexico grew out of the same sentiment that compelled Lucretia Mott Elizabeth King Stanton and Susan B. Anthony to launch their effort. It grew from women's desire to have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness acknowledged, from women's desire to be recognized as capable of participating equally in the government that ruled their civic lives, capable of tackling the needs that they saw in their own communities in areas such as public education, hygiene, libraries, alcohol, and slavery. It grew from knowing that their fathers, husbands, and male relatives did not see the world exactly as they did, and therefore could not and should not speak for them at the ballot box. 
They come from a realization that no matter how carefully they have studied the issues and how carefully they have proposed an agenda for change, politicians were unwilling to listen to a disenfranchised group. In the end, women have to have the vote themselves. It's true that at the turn of the 20th century, many women themselves were either opposed to or relatively indifferent to their own enfranchisement. The demand for suffrage was most resonant among middle-class women, women from families engaged in the professions, trade or commerce, and educated women who lived in cities and developing suburbs, farm women and urban immigrant women were less responsive to the call. Yet many women around the country from all sides joined our women's clubs. This is a photo of Maud McBee Bloom, who is a suffragist from New Mexico. And it was while I was reading the 50th anniversary booklet of the Albuquerque Women's Club that she wrote in 1953, that I came across a passage that she said explained why all women's clubs in the United States formed. It referred to a visit by Charles Dickens to the United States. And it was by serendipity while I was looking into uh, the East Las Vegas uh, Women's Club that was named Sorosis, that I found the source for Maud McBee Bloom's story. This is from a page from the book, and it has her uh, handwritten annotations that uh, actually reference the Las Vegas uh, Women's Improvement Association. In any case, it turns out that in March 1868, the first professional women's club named Sorosis, which is aggregation, was organized in, uh, in New York City with 12 members by Jane Cunningham Crowley. Among its founding members was Fanny Fern, who was a popular columnist for the New York Ledger. She had been angered at newspaper women being excluded from the all-male New York press club when it had an honorary dinner for the author of Charles Dickens. That one is the fourth. So the women got together and formed their own club, and it grew rapidly. And the very next year, Sorosis had 83 members, and all of them were invited to the dinner at the New York Press Club. <laughs> Whether this is indeed the impetus for all women's clubs, it's a humorous and captivating incident. It showed women how righteous indignation could be used to ignite the change to benefit them and the causes they cared about. All kinds of women's clubs proliferated in New Mexico, as well as the rest of the country. It was common at that time for many men's organizations, such as veterans clubs, to have ladies auxiliaries to help with ceremonies on special holidays or fundraising social functions. That was the case in Las Vegas, where actually several women in the community, desiring to be more than auxiliaries, organized their own club, a local chapter of the Women's Christian Temperance Union in 1885. The first women's club in New Mexico may be that chapter of Sorosis, founded in East Las Vegas, New Mexico in 1887. The members convened regularly to present original essays and poems and to distribute their reading out assignments. This is a photograph of the Albuquerque Women's Club, founded in 1903 by several ladies for the betterment of women, morally and intellectually. They uh, met in the parlor of the commercial club and then went on to elect uh, president. They became uh, a president and a board. This is a, this is a view of the club looking east on Gold Avenue, looking east towards uh, the uh, mountains of New Mexico. And, uh, and the club is on the right hand side across from the first big tall white building. That's the little house there. I don't know if it's still there. I haven't gone to check it. But this is actually the list of the charter members. They accumulated 84 members that first year, and five of them had Hispanic surnames. Among those members was Mrs. Solomon Luna, and later on, Mrs. Octaviano Lana Solo were members. They were admirers, all of them, of Susan B. Anthony, and in 1905 had a, in 1905 had a program on her, uh, on her honor for the, her 85th birthday. Mm -hmm. 
And there were many other clubs around the state that were dedicated to self-improvement, temperance, community improvement, and arts and crafts. This is a photo of the Silver City Women's Club that began as the Mother's Club. Um, <coughs> this, this photograph is from about 1911. Among uh, the other women's clubs were the Women's Improvement Association in Las Cruces in 1894 that did buy the first purse for the city. And the San Jose Board of Trade and Library Association in 1892 that built the first library in San Jose. There were also the late Arthur's Mothers and Teachers Club and the Tularosa Fairness Ladies Working Club. Many of the clubs were uh, involved in maternalistic politics. That is the kind of politics that has to do with infant and child health, child and family welfare, public health and safety, but eventually they would all come to advocate for women's rights while still working on these traditional women's activities. As in the clubs and the suffrage organization nationally, the Mexico club members were mainly Euro, Euro, sorry, were mainly Euro Americans, middle class, well educated, well connected, influential women married to influential men. Though in the smaller towns there were working class women. Working for reform through these de facto segregated organizations, club members lost out on the influence that it kind of had in their community and on their male relatives, 35 of whom actually were territorial representatives in the legislature. They also had no reason to be standing on other New Mexico populations that worked in their own communities for civic reform, for churches, tribal groups, and family groups. I have no photo of African Americans in uh, New Mexico who were involved in the club movement, but they indeed were. Actually, black women in New Mexico founded their own federation of clubs that sometimes formed friendly alliances with Anglo clubs. The Colored Women's Federated Club in Albuquerque, also known as the Home Circle, which is still in service, it's still alive and going, was founded by eight matrons and Lula Black. And the purpose was to better prepare themselves for their duties as mothers and social leaders of their community in 1914. Among its agenda items was suffrage, prohibition, and lynching. Other African American women's clubs and communities, such as Black Run in the southeastern part of the state, tackled issues of sovereignty as well as education and town services, including the post office. So women realized they could no longer depend on men to enact legislation or advance the community focused agenda. Up to this point, women's organizations had to partner with sympathetic organizations run by men to get their agenda considered by politicians. But that was not a viable long-term strategy. Thus, as nationally, New Mexico women began to realize that in order to achieve reform, they needed to gain the right to vote. For these reasons, in 1900, women's clubs really began um, aggregating the suffrage organization and the movement actually became a mass movement. And there's a steady march in New Mexico towards suffrage, uh, which begins in 1874 and, and 1896, sorry, in 1874 and 1895, there were votes for suffrage in the territorial legislature. I don't know very much more about them. I'm still in the midst of doing research and I anticipate doing this for another year. But in any case, it's a long history. And these are the slides that have a lot of information. You don't need to read them, you may. And it really just to show you how, how things kept progressing and going forward. In 1890, the Women's Christian Temperance Union had a department of franchise headed by Ada Morley, who had read a paper at the fifth annual convention of the union titled Equal Franchise. The suffrage it supported had educational qualifications that put a premium on the education and character of the voter. Although much effort went into this, women in New Mexico were more interested in what was going on in, in terms of statehood and in prohibition. This is Ada McPherson Morley, who is one of the earliest suffragists in New Mexico, who spent all her life actually dedicated to, uh, to reform for children, for women, women's suffrage, and, and actually also for black people. <coughs> in 1893, the Albuquerque Suffrage Club was formed in Albuquerque by Mrs. Rainer and Mrs. Marble. 
And in 1896, the Territorial Equal Suffrage Association was formed in New Mexico. And one of the members were the parents of Maud Maxine Green, that suffragist I told you about earlier. Both of them, uh, Judge John and his wife, Mary Steele, were advocates for that association. And the woman in white in the middle is Maud Maxine Green. That's a photo of them in uh, Santa Fe. Male supporters, obviously, uh, male, um, sorry, men also supported uh, suffrage. And without them, uh, suffrage could not have come about because they were in the legislatures and had to vote for it. But anyway, some of them really supported early on, and there was a representative, a delegate to the United States Congress from New Mexico called A.T. Ferguson. He represented the territory in the National Woman Suffrage, Equal Woman Suffrage Association Convention. In 1899, Carrie Chapman Catt came to New Mexico to reorganize the association, and in 1900, it emerged as the National, as the National American Women's Suffrage Association, or NAUSA. Uh, and the, this, among its members, uh, some women that will come up in, uh, in suffrage history over and over again. There was Mar Dr. Margaret Cartwright, a physician in Albuquerque. There was um, Ina Sizer Cassidy in Santa Fe, who was the first president of the League of Women Voters. There was Deanne Lindsay, who was a teacher married to uh, a man who became governor of New Mexico, the third governor, Washington Lindsay, and she was also a tireless advocate for women's rights and suffrage. Uh, there was Mrs. John R. McPhee, I just showed you her, and another doctor from Las Vegas called Alice Rice. Despite all the work to organize and willingness of members to work for the causes, not much assistance was given to the state organization by the National NAUSA League. It turned out that Carrie Chapman Catt had realized that it would be almost impossible to amend the New Mexico state constitution. Therefore, the suffrage strategy that they had was to get amendments in the state it did not work here. And the constitution, as I have read, has been made up deliberately difficult to amend to protect the rights of Hispanics and Mexicans to vote, hold office, or sit upon juries, even if they were unable to speak, read, or write the English or Spanish language. Amending that constitution, that section of the constitution required a vote by three quarters of each chamber of the uh, legislature, three quarters of the voters in the state, and two thirds of the voters uh, voting in each county. So really impossible to amend. Nevertheless, suffrage work got done. In 1900, the New Mexico Women's Suffrage Association sent a letter to the Republican and Democratic Party convention asking for suffrage in all matters pertaining to schools. And they really focused on the schools because they thought that making the jump from no suffrage to universal suffrage was too much. So they just <coughs> looked at it from the point of view of did women take care of children? Most women are, te are te teaching uh, the children. So maybe they were entitled, not maybe, but they were entitled to at least have a voice in how the schools were run. And they also, interestingly enough, in 1900, um, sent um, delegate Pedro Perea, who was a territorial delegate to the Congress, with a petition that they had written asking for the passage of the 16th Amendment to the Constitution, prohibiting the disenfranchisement of US citizens based on sex. So when we started this fight, it was way before the 16th Amendment, but at this point in 1900, it was the 16th Amendment. By the time we ratified, other amendments had come in before. The other thing that's of interest to me about, among, uh, about what uh, Representative Delegate Perea did was that he also submitted to the Committee on Territories a petition from the Women's Suffrage Group in New Mexico urging that Congress do not insert the word male in whatever form of government is enacted for Hawaii, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and any other newly acquired possession. And that was from the delegates in New Mexico. So the march continues. In 1905, the Santa Fe New Mexican reported that a bill had been introduced in the legislature, but someone, one of the representatives had said, women simply do not want it. 
whenever they want it, the male citizens of New Mexico will be gallant enough to give it to them. Uh, well, we have to wait another 15 years for them to do that. The most powerful Republican of the Territorial Convention in 1910 was Solomon Luna from Valencia County, who was a sheep rancher and a banker and very successful and, um, and um, strong um, committed politician. He supported women's suffrage for, uh, for the school board and encouraged his niece, Evelina Otero Warren, to work for it. In 1910, just before the Territorial Constitutional Convention, the Women's Christian Temperance Union sponsored a debate in Mountain Air on the question of the ballot for women. That may have been the first time New Mexicans ever argued the issue in public. The members of the Albuquerque Women's Club sent a letter uh, signed by, by Mrs. D.H. Carnes, who was the president of the organization, praying your honorable body to extend the franchise to women on all school questions. And they were successful. They won the right to vote as for school trustees on bond issues and in the local administration of public schools, but not for superintendents that were still being appointed. And this is a neat little clip that Laura is going to run for us this morning. This is from the 1914 Albuquerque Day Parade, <coughs> and it shows you what was going on in 1914 in Albuquerque. This may have been around the time of the fair. There's the YMCA for Albuquerque represented. And coming behind them is the Women's Christian Temperance <laughs> Union. <laughs> and behind the bikes are the votes for women. <laughs> and you see there's enthusiasm and cheering and the crowds are, are just enjoying this wonderful day. And it yet still took us another six years to get where we needed to go. Women in New Mexico continued to join NASA during this time, even though not much was going on from that organization. <coughs> in fact, they joined both uh, women's clubs and uh, suffrage clubs, and Leanne Lindsay, the state chair of NASA at that time, also headed the legislative department of the New Mexico Federation of Women's Clubs in 1914 when they came out for suffrage. Many men again joined the effort, and at the national, at the state convention of the Federation of Women's Clubs, men actually donated cars so that women could be transported down into uh, the nearby uh, towns of Bayard, Hurley, and Santa Rita, so they could go down into the pit of the mine, because apparently this was a very exciting thing to do, <laughs> amidst the smoke and dust of the enormous new open pit copper mine the din of explosions and steam engines, the caravan of women went. <laughs> and again, uh, there's always a confluence of events. So there was a bifurcation in the strategy uh, for suffrage. They uh, now saw advocated, uh, led by Terry Chapman Platt, advocated uh, an effort in every state to get the, the legislatures to amend the Constitution to give women suffrage. Uh, that allowed for state rights because the state could then control how they would do this. But it also allowed the states uh, to give the vote to women, uh, some and uh, maybe not to other women. So that did not seem like a good strategy uh, to Alice Hall. The other difference between the two organizations is that the, uh, the, uh, the organization led by Terry Chapman Platt, they were more conservative. Of course, they were radical wanted women's votes. They were more conservative and they were very well to do and they had the ears of the presidents, of the Congress, the um, legislators, uh, businessmen. Uh, and so they, they vote a little uh, more carefully when they went uh, seeking uh, votes for suffrage. Nevertheless, they were very effective. The Congressional Union on the other side, led by Alice Paul, who had just really started in the movement in 1912 when she came back from England after spending some time there studying and some time with the Pankhursts, who were the women who led the suffrage movement in England. Uh, she came back and she started the Congressional Union, initially as part of NAUSA, but eventually they diverged. Uh, Alice Paul's thought was that um, 
got, we needed a federal amendment. We needed a federal amendment to really um, uh, legislate uh, women's suffrage in every state. And in doing so, when the, 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 the women's suffrage came to the state, they would have the same rules, the same requirements, <coughs> and they would allow all women to get the vote, as opposed to some women uh, who might, uh, who might uh, be uh, well-to-do, well-educated, and not black or minority women. So Alice Paul uh, felt that the strategy needed to come out of Washington, and so they focused their agenda on Washington. And they also lobbied Congress, of course, because they needed them to pass the amendment out of Congress eventually. But the other thing they did was they uh, courted the, uh, the, uh, the news media. They held events that were very uh, militant in some ways, that garnered the attention of the news media, and then, of course, uh, garnered the attention of the public. And sometimes the public uh, not only uh, learned a lot about what was going on in terms of suffrage and why women wanted this, but the public also learned that there were different tactics. And sometimes when the women uh, were being uh, abused, they became sympathetic. And so the, um, the Congressional Union drew uh, the emotions of the people to their side. The first organizers from the, con from the Congressional Union, remember NASA had been here since 1900, the first ones for the Congressional Union came in 1914. And they began to organize with the New Mexico Christian Temperance Union, which had endorsed women's suffrage uh, much earlier on the grounds that women needed the vote to protect their families from alcohol and other vices, as well as domestic abuse. The Congressional Union organizer attended the Union Convention in 1914 and urged women to begin a letter writing campaign. Many women took up the call, including Ada, including Ada Morley, who had begun writing letters to sway and sometimes castigate politicians as a young woman in Cimarron, and she never stopped. By February 1916, they all started, uh, started uh, writing the letters, but Leanne Lindsay complained to Morley that, I think Senator Chapman has been strong and strong again over the suffrage matter. The Santa Fe women have written and written and all to no avail. So in order to access a more powerful base of socially prominent women, aside from the union women, the Congressional Union then came to Santa Fe and the North to try to get the club women to join the movement. And they worked with a North Africa named Ella Sinclair Thompson. And they were uh, pretty successful. In 1915, the Congressional Union enjoyed a committed, a committed network of support, especially among middle class and elite Anglo club women in uh, northern New Mexico. And then organizers began to reach out to Hispanic women. Ella wrote to Alice Paul, they say it is very difficult to get the Spanish women out, but as I have one on the program to speak in Spanish, I think they will come out, and their husbands as well. And they did. Ella's effort worked well because she was able to reach uh, the uh, Spanish-speaking population, uh, especially among the elite women. And she also got two nieces of Solomon and Lina, Adelina Otero Horan and Aurora Lucero, to become active in the movement. Both uh, insisted on having bilingual flyers and did speeches in Spanish at public rallies, and they brought out suffrage uh, um, support among both men and women in the Hispanic communities. Here's a photo of Aurora Lucero in 1934, much later, but she was already a member of the Congressional Union at age 19. So in 1915, 150 suffragists went up on a car caravan to speak to Senators Strong and, and Catherine. Uh, the women made four brief addresses at the home of Senator Catherine. The women who were uh, able to speak were Aurora Lucero, Mrs. Uh, Julia Brown Aslan, Mrs. Cleopas Romero, and uh, Ella uh, Sinclair Thompson. Aurora Lucero was a skilled orator, so she was embarrassed <coughs> by almost. So she led the effort and, made, and gave the, uh, the, the talk that centered on the political point of view of the Spanish American woman. I speak for the Spanish-American woman 
to well and servitude once the best possible laws from the home life is the question at issue. I represent the daughters of the conquistadores who first reclaimed this country from the wilderness and all other women of the state. I do include that statement because it's important to realize that these were women of their time. Sometimes we expect them to behave as we do today, and many do, but there were many issues going on and many points of view, so just, just putting that there. And Julia Brown Asplund spoke about women property owners and land owners who were unjustly taxed without having a voice, taxation without representation, a cry that goes back to the Revolutionary War, and nobody was listening to them. Anyway, as the newspapers reported, Senator Kaplan could not accommodate the ladies. <laughs> he said they are the weaker sex designed to bear children, men are the hardy ones and the providers, women would be soiled by politics, <laughs> ladies wouldn't vote, and only the lower class women could vote. Women had to wait until Kaplan was defeated in his bid for re-election in 1916. By that time, after that time, all municipal Congress people were for suffrage. As they continued uh, to work, have I been moving along all this time? Yes, I have. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, what I did, I may have, I didn't show you that. So still, you know, we're how many years now? Like uh, <laughs> 60 years into this movement, and you know, we were still ridiculed going on. I want to vote, but my wife won't let me. Everybody, uh, except for mother, uh, oh, everybody works, but mother, she's a suffragette. <laughs> And the, a word about suffragettes and suffragists. Suffragettes is a term applied to gay women in England who actually was called suffragettes as a term of derision, and they sort of owned it. But in the United States, we call women suffragists. And not only women, but men, because suffragists are men and women who believe in, in universal suffrage. So just uh, to show you that though the uh, Congressional Union had been in the state since 1914, it was in 1916 that they were really forming a, uh, the actual organization. And among the officers were Adelina Otero Warren, Julia Asplund, and Mary McPhee. And according to John Jensen, uh, a little look at uh, suffragists at that time showed that Congressional Union members were 80, council members were 30, uh, Federation of Women's Clubs was 25, um, Christian Temperance Union 9. The political party affiliations were Republican 20, Democrats 4, and one in Socialists. <laughs> and the march continues for suffrage. In 1916, actually, uh, Ada Morley, who was by now 65 years old, and she had been almost totally blind for many years, uh, she was ailing, but still she was active and writing letters to the end. And Dr. Jesse Russell, uh, a Congressional Union organizer from California, came, and they organized a big rally uh, for women's suffrage and for Ada Morley in Magdalena. In 1917, it turns out the state convention of both political parties declared they were in favor of women's suffrage. And there was a large meeting at the governor's mansion. By then, it was Governor Lindsay where uh, women and supporters worked uh, to uh, a strategy out to address the legislature at the le le legislative uh, session. Among those present were Senator Bart, Paul Mercer, Charles Springer, Governor Lindsay, Ms. Cora Kellum, uh, Ms. Kate Cole, Mrs. Lindsay. And I just have this as a placeholder. I'm still looking for a photo of Cora Kellum. In 1917, Otero Warren enjoyed such a loyal following that she was chosen by Alice Bell to lead the state congressional union in New Mexico. Her mission was to bombard the New Mexico congressional delegation to win their support in the battle to pass the Susan B. Anthony Amendment and then to get it to the New Mexico legislature as a small task. <laughs> Despite the fact that various groups worked really hard 
to get the legislators to pass the amendment, it failed in the session. In fact, I don't even know that if they took it up. But as the newspaper reported, suffrage lost by a little. But a little was not too bad, thinking about what we have done. It's disappointing in many ways. <clears throat> and so then, of course, continuing with our confluence of events, it's World War I. World War I gave women the opportunity to show that they could do men's work even while doing their own. They answered the president's call to take over tasks men had left behind when they went to war. Women's suffragists led the women's war effort nationally to the Women's Committee on the Council of National Defense, and that was uh, Dr. Anna Howard Shaw, who uh, was the head of that committee, and Terry Chapman, who one of the third lieutenants. And in New Mexico, they, um, this, um, the war effort on behalf of women was uh, led by Mrs. Deanne Lindsay. On Wilson's 1917, 1917 call to the nation to conserve <coughs> and plant gardens, Isabella Selmas Ferguson of Tyrone, New Mexico, began urging communities throughout New Mexico to plant war gardens with vacant lands. Using conscripted prisoners to supplement volunteer laborers, she converted 140 acres of land owned by Phelps Dodge Company into a large community garden. She also organized women in southwestern New Mexico to harvest an ocean of corn near Tyrone. It's no wonder that as a 1917 New Mexico group of states, New Mexico was just one of the first states, if not the first, to mobilize its women for war service through an effective statewide organization. New Mexico women had already been doing this for many years. They had a lot of practice. And so, finally, the Women's Land Army comes along. In July 1918, Isabella Ferguson of Tyrone was named by Governor Lindsay to head the Women's Land Army Legislature. Over 500 women joined. They were paid $2 a day plus room and board. Working conditions were harsh. 10 hours spent on the fields, sometimes in temperatures that went over 105 degrees. And at the end of the day, sometimes no beds, only alfalfa or pine boughs to lie on. Yet, much to the delight and sometimes surprise of the farmers they were helping, they got the job done. Two or three women harvested 30 acres of alfalfa in four days in another location uh, sorry, in four days, and in another location, eight women moved, raked, and stacked 16 tons of hay. Whoa. Mm -hmm. And still they smiled, played, and survived. <laughs> Isabella was a hands-on manager who pitched in to help wherever she was needed. Someone said she was a farmerette, farmerettes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she's the one in the hat, and the other one's enjoying the water. <laughs> <coughs> and by August, the newspaper in Silver City announced, Women's Land Army saves hunt on Gila. And yet, back in Washington, the campaign continued, and the New Mexicans were keeping track of it. A Nuevo Mexicano newspaper reported in uh, 1917 that White House pickets were attacked by a mob of men over a handwritten flag saying the U.S. has no democracy since 20 million women are denied the vote. The men yelled, this is treason, you are traitors. So that ignited a controversy here uh, because there were, of course, differences in philosophy and strategy and, uh, and method on the part of NASA and the Congressional Union, moderate before, uh, uh, versus militant. And sometimes these disagreements erupted as it did over the story. In uh, the Santa Fe New Mexican reported that the Santa Fe uh, <coughs> said Santa Fe suffrages for White House pickets. And Mrs. Asplund posted, po sorry, posted Ann Martin, who was a congressional delegation uh, uh, organizer. And she brought flags that had been at the White House picket. She had been arrested, jailed, and convicted. And the president had, parted, had pardoned her and other suffrages days. A big celebration ensued at the Santa Fe Courthouse. On the other hand, of course, is Mrs. Lindsay, and this is the only photo I have ever encountered. 
they were inclined to support, and there may be others that support that his I'm not Thomas husband. But Mrs. Lindsay sends a letter to the president expressing her and New Mexico's disapproval of these kinds of taxes. And I believe he sent back a note that went out. <coughs> and again, while this is all going on, Alice Russell stars with a representative of Spade onto the National Women's Society flag because Spade, even during the war, was not a fan of women's suffrage. The march continued. And in 1918, uh, yet another meeting of the suffrage forces in Albuquerque and uh, Santa Fe at the executive mansion, uh, hosted by Mrs. Lindsay and her husband, uh, Governor William Siegel, I would say, along with Colonel Jeremiah, was a suffragist. So Senator Jones, in 1916, had succeeded uh, Senator Catherine and had gone uh, to the Congress from uh, Las Vegas to the Senate to now chair the Influential Senate Committee on Women's Suffrage. He visited the military jail for Washington protests. He saw the Susan B. Anthony women out of committee onto the Senate floor a number of times, and he worked for a, seriously for its passage. In 1919 and 1919, the House passed it, but still the Senate did not. Finally, two months before the end of the war, President Wilson went to Capitol Hill to urge senators to vote for it. He stressed the importance of women's work in the war effort and, I, and asked that they pass the amendment as a war measure. This is a great poster. As a war measure, the country asked women to be farmers, mechanics, nurses, glass makers, motormen, uh, telehandlers, army cooks, and the country is getting it. Women are asking the country, franchise me. Are the women going to get it? <laughs> Great. So, the president said before the Congress, we have made partners of women in the war. Shall we not make them, sorry, shall we admit them only to partnership of suffering and sacrifice and toil, and not to a partnership of privilege and right? Under the leadership of Senator Jones, the Senate, the Senate voted favorably in June 1919. After 50 years of independent organizing for suffrage, women have finally flagged the federal suffrage amendment out of Congress. It went to the states where NAUSA and the congressional members, where the congressional union members immediately began to lobby those legislatures. By the time that the war ended in November 1918, referenda across the country showed that in three quarters of the state, the people favored women's suffrage. So the, the whole movement had shifted. And they uh, and this is the, the wording of the 19th Amendment. It says um, the right of the uh, citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Simple. And yet it took 72 years to get to this point. So then he fell onto the governor of Manitoba's lap to uh, take care of this issue. He was a supporter of suffrage. He got really angry when the legislature did not uh, take it up and failed to do anything about it. He was being bombarded with letters and telegrams from national and local groups and from individual citizens in handwritten and typed letters for and against suffrage. Here's a letter from the Farmers National Council that had 3,100 members and they support the suffrage. And here's a, a letter from the Women's Committee for uh, Ratification uh, consisting of Mrs. Barnes, Adelino Bill Warren, I thought Mrs. Wilson, Mrs. Barr, Mrs. Walter. They made the case that they have taken on the responsibility and made sacrifices and paid taxes without being represented that it was time to give women the vote. The women uh, uh, mission has always been to protect home and family. And now there are forces at work uh, that are uh, coming from abroad, Bolshevism and radicalism, and the women need to get the vote to help. 
help to take the country against those forces. So this is really interesting because when we go back to the issue of home and housekeeping as the major uh, interest in, in suffrage in a way, and they also turn back, you know, on its head the, the fact that they have been called Bolsheviks, socialists, uh, radicals, traitors for many years. So now they're using this to scare the, uh, the legislators uh, to get to the vote. In any case, so, uh, and, but still there were uh, national organizations of folks like women. This letter, and you can see them all in the state archives, which is a great treasure. You know, uh, all of these, uh, not all of these, many of these come out of there. And uh, this letter was because the National Association of Post to Women Suffrage opposes it on the basis of the loss of states' rights. States could no longer, if there was a federal amendment discriminating against who could vote, apply a poll tax to black people out. They couldn't do that in the past. So, but we were still seeking the same thing for the long work we did, for the taxes we paid, for the laws we obey. We want something the same. <laughs> <coughs> and finally, Carrie Chapman Cat, as in my poem, comes into Albuquerque that December 3rd. And actually, uh, she came to ask the governor for a special session of the legislature. She spoke before large crowds and got ovations at the Albuquerque YMCA, at the Albuquerque Women's Club, at the Albuquerque Rotary Club. In fact, that, that was the first time the Rotary Club had <coughs> the Rotary members, but everyone else. But here's a telegraph on that very same day that she spoke there from the Rotary Club asking Governor Larazola to give women the vote. And he did call for the special session. By the time Lino Otero Warren began her last push for Republican leaders to get them to sign the amendment in January of 1919, the groundwork had been laid by hundreds of women here in New Mexico who had worked tirelessly for this moment for at least 46 years. They had shown their ability to organize and get things done, working at home, in the community, in factories and farms. Minds had been opened to the idea that all men and women are created equal. Right, that's from the Declaration of Sentiments of 1843. So the campaign had been fought in New Mexico vigorously. To my knowledge, no one in New Mexico was veiled in workhouses, horse heads, nor placed in psychiatric institutions for wanting to vote. No women lost their children when husbands decided that wives won an autonomy, if it is just to assert their human right to have a say in what happens, a say in what happens to them, uh, were, were um, capable of being uh, proper mothers. Uh, no women were divorced or their children taken away, as men could be at that time, because they had worked for suffrage. As far as I know, that didn't happen, but I have not looked further into this yet. And just before the legislature, that special session convened, it was wonderful that uh, women's accomplishments prior to 1920 were all then being uh, heralded by the newspaper. Even before that special session, the 1920 Cannery Estancia News Herald cataloged their accomplishments. They had gotten school suffrage for women, raised the age of consent from age 10 to 14. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they, they uh, wives are now needed to consent. The wife's consent was, was needed for disposal of community property by husbands. They were influential in getting juvenile court um, the care of dependent and neglected children, child welfare and girls' welfare board, the prohibition amendment, and the state the council help. And the uh, newspaper notes uh, Deanne Lindsay, Cora Kellum, and Nino Otero Warren as being uh, some of the people who led that movement. So as Nino Otero Warren marshaled her forces on one side, forces on the other side, anti-suffrage forces, were still uh, going uh, to battle, including the Catholic Church, which was uh, pretty uh, powerful here. They wanted the authority definitely, and her allies in the legislature. On February 18, Representative Dan Padilla of Albuquerque proposed a referendum to let voters decide about suffrage. 
But you know that the Constitution requires a very high bar to be passed to make a Constitution to be able to do that. So that really was, was very disingenuous at the very least. So in any case, the newspaper reported all the city was up in arms. Men's organizations, the YMCA, the Christian Temperance Union, the Women's Committee, the Women's Party, individual men and women, all were in arms until he declared he would go to the immediate clarification. When the time for the final debate came on February 19, suffragists women packed the Senate galleries. Republicans shifted their support to the amendment and they ratified by a vote of 17 to 5. The House blocked passing the amendment, but Carol Warren spent three hours in the Republican caucus, the first time any woman had been allowed into that group to make deliberations. At the end, the House ratified the amendment 36 to 10 and New Mexico became the 32nd state to ratify the amendment. I mean, even 36. So as you can see, the Senate vote 77% yes, and in the House 78% yes. If that hadn't happened, it wouldn't have passed. But nevertheless, um, that was a rat uh, ratification to the amendment was for national election President. For women to vote in these states and in local elections and run for office, the New Mexico Constitution had to be amended. And that happened in 1921. It's important to remember that though the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution applied to all women, many groups were not enfranchised, and some who were had no access to the ballot box nationally and in New Mexico for many years. This is an affidavit from Mrs. Julia Annette Claw, who had been denied registration for the vote in San Juan County in 1946. And this is Miguel Trujillo, who was denied registration in Valencia County in 1948 when he came back from having fought for this country in the war and was so he did not because he was not, he did not pay taxes. He sued and actually won the suit against uh, New Mexico that had to go to the Arizona. And it's important to remember that the voting rights are still on the march, right? So from the 1920 uh, women's suffrage, the Indian Citizenship Act in 1924 allowed women only Native Americans to vote. Educated women in Puerto Rico could vote in 1929, but all the rest had to wait until 1935. The Magnuson Act that did away with the Chinese uh, Exclusion Act, the Asian people with the right to vote. And then, as I said, Miguel Trujillo and the voting rights of Native Americans in New Mexico. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 helped uh, the, uh, many of the disenfranchised uh, people of color, especially. And of course, you know that we're still marching towards uh, having universal suffrage in this country. I don't know if women in New Mexico put these signs on their windows as a ratification. Most likely they did because they were in tune with the rest of the country. Emma Moya, uh, the Old Town historian, told me that voting was important and elections were festive in Old Town. This is not an Old Town picture. She told me that women who had access to cars would drive around Old Town picking up other women to take them to vote. <laughs> I also don't know whether Soledad Amiga Chavez Chacon was one of those women driving the car or being driven in the car. Uh, she did uh, come from a family whose uh, Maria Teresa's restaurant uh, is uh, part of their, their, their home uh, base. Uh, but I do know that Soledad Amiga Chavez Chacon was elected as the New Mexico, uh, became New Mexico, uh, New Mexico's first woman secretary of state in 1922. And not only that, she became New Mexico's and the country's first woman governor. When she was acting chief executive while Governor Hinkle was out of the state in 1924, she took over the duties of the government for a month. So technically, she was the governor of New Mexico at that time. Mm -hmm. And all, and she was able to do that because all across this country, women fought for 72 years to have their voices. Democracy should begin at home. 
Thank you.